Hello everybody and thanks very much for joining us today. Um, we'll just give everybody a couple of minutes to arrive and then we will kick things off with today's webinar. OK, so we'll get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks uh, for joining us for this uh, webinar in association with our uh, SWEEP project, Investing in Nature for Health. Um, a special thanks to those of you who are joining us for the second time for this webinar. Um, we managed to iron out our technical challenges um, and are delighted to be able to welcome back uh, John O'Reeves for today's webinar. Um, so I'm not going to do too much of an introductory spiel, um, just to say that, um, that, yeah, like I say, the webinar is in association with our SWEEP project, and I'll say a little bit more about that um, at the end of the session after Jono's uh, talk and our Q&A, um, and I'll do a brief sort of uh, uh, sales pitch for our next webinar as well when we get there. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm really happy to have Jono Reeves joining us here to present today's webinar. Um, Jono is Principal Research Officer at WWT for Health and Wellbeing. Um, and today he's going to talk to us about wetlands and forests for health and wellbeing. So um, he'll start off describing uh, the work of WWT and the stuff they're doing around health and wellbeing. Um, but then he's also going to talk to us about um, his Churchill Fellowship from a while ago when he got to go and uh, investigate forest bathing and I'll leave him to describe that all to us. So John is going to talk for around half an hour or so um, and then we'll have time for some Q&A at the end. Um, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, you should have a question button that you can uh, type your question into. Feel free to stick them in there as we go along. Um, and then I can relay those questions to Jono um, at the end when we get there. Um, so hopefully that all makes sense. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Jono and let you get on with your presentation. So thanks very much, Jono. Sorry, Jono, you just need to unmute yourself.
Hi, Jono. Sorry, we still can't hear you. I think you need to find the unmute button somewhere in your Teams. I'm just going to stop sharing your slides for a moment. Ah, we can hear. You. I found it. Oh yeah, great. Oh my, why did that? Why did that switch from? We would. Oh my goodness. Okay, everybody. We're, we're, this is so we're, frustrating. We'll get going. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good. I had a good dry run though. Okay. <laughs> if you want to go back to the start, John, because we haven't caught any of it yet. Right. Hang on a sec. OK, right, so what I would you can hear me now, right, Ben? Yeah, yeah, OK, so WWC, we conserve, restore and create wetlands and inspire everyone to value the amazing things that healthy wetlands can do for us. So that's our remit. And we we do that principally through our centres. So we have 10 wetland centres around the UK, uh, seven sites of special scientific interest, um, five special protection areas. We have seven different rounds on sites, over 3000 hectares of wetland habitat and over 200,000 uh, members and a million visitors a year. Um, additionally, to the census, we have tons of conservation projects going on around uh, the UK and internationally to, to try and protect and conserve and create wetlands. Some of that is around uh, species conservation, like bears, potchard, blacktail, godwits, for example. Some of the other work um, happens on international wetlands like Madagascar, Cambodia, um, we're also working on things like monitoring the Buick swans, natural flood management, and then to the more social side of things, you know, we're trying to, you know, find swan champions in the Russian Arctic to help us protect uh, Buick swans, and also working on lead ammunition issue, which we've had some recent wins on on recently, and we're very close to getting a ban there, which is a real great conservation win for us. And then onto this sort of wetlands and human health and well-being, which is the, the focus of, of, of my work really. Um, so within that conservation department, we have an evidence department where I sit, so that principally makes up a you know, folk who are working on wetland science, species science, and also looking at the social dimensions of, of wetland conservation, which is where my work sits. Um, and then overall, we work to a general theory of change. So we're trying to get to this end point of where we have healthy wetland nature, thriving, and enriching lives. And we do that in different ways. So we look on, we work to like um, UK, farm landscapes, waterscapes around our WWT centres, uh, looking at threatened species, um, but also you know, a lot of work centred on our focus, or focus on our centres in UK area, UK urban areas, uh, wetlands in developing countries and along flyaways as well. And our health and wellbeing work principally sits in, in you know, working at our centres in UK urban areas. Um, and so what we're trying to do then is uh, work on direct action, we're looking at demonstration, engagement, evidence, and training all of this, all of this trying to influence people. So we're trying to influence the public who then can hopefully create pressure on decision makers to get policy change, behaviour change and direct change in order to, to get to the end here. And this this link up here has relevance to what I'm going to describe later in terms of Japan, because that that ability to engage a public that can you know, generate political pressure is, is can be important for conservation. So um, one area that's of, of, of quite um, a, a big focus at the moment is this blue recovery um, idea and uh, we have four proposals for blue infrastructure proposals for the UK's recovery from from the pandemic um, and these really hone in on the four different areas that are essential to WWT's work at the moment and that's wetlands as a carbon storage network um, how, we, how that can help um, you know battle against climate change the second is around flood protection obviously we've had lots of flooding recently you know how can wetlands help us in that challenge uh, also in terms of a water treatment network and providing habitat for for species and then there's obviously this urban well-being um, idea we're all going to be you know 68 percent of us will be living in the urban environment in 2050 so how can we how can we have that uh, green and blue um, provision right for that challenge so then overall my work is focused on health and well-being benefits of people you know, being close to wetlands and how we can understand that better and get it recognized more in the public and, and uh, political spheres. So to do that, we've you know we've been working in this area for a good few years now, and we've got some publications under our belt. Um, one of those is um, about 
Uh, we did some work using wearable technology and looking at psychophysiological differences between the ways how people reacted in, in wetlands versus how they are in, urban, in, in the urban environment. We used our London Wetland Centre um, down in London, if you know that one, to, to juxtapose people to see in the urban environment and wetland environment. And then we had a paper as well published on, which has been the basis of our blue prescription work, which I'll describe in a moment. And this is about uh, piloting our nature-based interventions at our centres and how we how we um, were able to demonstrate good improvements in people's well-being um, through um, these nature-based interventions at our sites. Um, and then more recently, we're going to have a paper coming out soon, uh, which we looked at, uh, did a qualitative analysis of our wetland centres and the visitors to our wet, wetland centres and how they're using those centres as, as a health resource. So look out for that one. Um, so I mentioned blue prescriptions, and this is a, 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 an important area for our work into the future, and it will be in, sort of in the immediate future as well. And our blue prescription, is, I guess, is a is a wetland version of a green prescription, which is a version of a, a nature based version of a social prescription. And social prescriptions are, um, uh, you know, facilities for connecting people to community services and diverting them away from primary care and helping relieve pressure on the NHS. And it's in relation to this this problem of one in five GP visits are, are not medical in nature. So there needs to be alternatives for, for some of those people. There's been a lot of policy interest in this. The government has invested in it. We have a thousand link workers, those people that are connecting people um, to services. We have a thousand now and there'll be four and a half thousand into, into 2024. So we're trying to understand what role wetlands and nature can provide um, for that for that um, for that program, that agenda. Um, one of those ways that we're doing that is through blue prescriptions, trying to roll those out. And it's been a kind of a long battle over the last year to try and get some funding to, to roll that out. And most recently we have had some had some success through the Green Recovery Challenge Fund, which I'll describe a bit more in a moment. Um, and then something else that's just happening at the moment is this project, which is Generation Wild, which has recently been funded, and that will see 45,000 school children from disadvantaged communities and their families and teachers coming to our centres. Um, and that's very much based around trying to um, uh, sort of engender more meaningful and emotional connection with nature and less about you know, knowledge acquisition with those kids. Um, and we've got a PhD that's being advertised at the moment with the University of Cardiff. So we're looking for a good student to come on board and help us with that. So if anybody's interested out there, please um, get in touch. Uh, I don't know if any of the team, Kev or Julia, is listening. If they could drop an advert into the chat, that would be good. Otherwise, contact me and I can, I can set you up. Um, so this blue prescription is that steer, as I mentioned there, we've got some funding through the Green Recovery Challenge Fund, which is part of a bigger project about enhancing climate resilience on the Somerset coast. So that will overall will, will look to create 130 hectares of, of wetland habitat, uh, you know, delivering landscape scale type interventions. But alongside that, we're going to be looking at some health and wellbeing work as well. And we've got a health and wellbeing officer who will be starting next week. Um, we've got some money for an online mental health management course in partnership with our, our partners, Mental Health Foundation. We've got some money for a minibus to help us get over some of those access barriers that I think many of us will know are a problem for these kind of um, activities. And we've got money for outdoor clothing as well, recognising that you know not everybody turns up with the, with the right gear. Um, the scope will be sort of mend it to Bridgewater, but you know, good focus on our WWT Steer Marshes site. But, you know, targeting Bridgewater and Western Supermare as well, those areas that are going to have probably more um, high health inequalities, and more health challenges. So for that project, then we're looking at it's only 12, it's only about 12, 13 months of project left. We'll finish in March 22. But we've got sort of three distinct phases that we'll, we'll look to, to work on. One of those is a development phase, which will involve lots of networking. So trying to work with the primary care networks, the clinical commissioning groups and the integrated care systems to get us linked up with those link workers and have them aware of what we're trying to do and help us steer it. Um, at the same time, there is the uh, Bristol, uh, North Somerset and South Gloucester green prescribing pilot that's happening in the region for the, the national green prescribing pilots, if you know about those. So we'll look to try and link up with them, obviously not trying to duplicate effort. Similarly, with the Somerset Wildlife Nature Connections project, which is which is happening in the region, we look to connect to connect up with them. So look to establish as well a cross sectoral steering group and then scoping and co-creating activities and planning research. Is, of course, we've got strong links with the with the University of Exeter and we'll look to uh, work with those guys to help us make sure we, we evaluate properly. So then to delivery, we'll continue development of activities, look at the research and evaluation, and then continued engagement with, with healthcare. 
and then into the final stage, we looked to write up and you know, publish our results and go through the comms and engage national and po local policy decision makers again to try and um, you know get these these kind of things cemented and working with the, with the healthcare providers as well. So for our, a lot of our work, we have uh, we rely on academic partnerships and PhDs. So uh, one of those is with the University of Exeter again. So uh, Ruth Garside and her team working on the Nature on Prescription. Uh, project and this is they've developed a nature on prescription manual and we'll look to help those guys to try and hone that and, and, and use blue prescriptions as a test bed for that. Uh, we have a PhD student at Imperial College, uh, Richard Belcher, who's helping, who's looking at assessing understudy factors that affect the relationship between urban green space and blue space with health. Um, and then finally Hannah Forbes is part of the sweep network. Um, and she's got funding through them. So that's with Ben and Becca, uh, Becca Lovell and Ben Wheeler at the University of Exeter. And she's helping us look at, at nature-based social prescriptions at WWT sites. So these blue pres prescriptions, how we can make them work for obviously the people that are coming on it, but also for WWT and, and the wider, wider system as well. OK, so that was a brief whiz around um, WWT's work. And now I'm going to move on to talk to you about the, my Churchill Fellowship, in, which was in uh, Japan and Korea over seven weeks. Um, and this was a part of a Winston Churchill Memorial Trust Fellowship, which those guys, they fund overseas research grants for about four to eight weeks. It's very much about practical inquiry and um, academic, not academic research. So um, and they fund all parts of society, so arts, the environment, um, so social care, healthcare, all of that kind of thing. So if anybody's interested in, in taking up one of these, I would definitely recommend it. It's, it's one of those like once in a lifetime opportunities that are, you know, it's a great opportunity. Um, so my project was uh, very much about um, nature conservation and how um, understanding how um, Japan and Korea were implementing sort of nature for health ideas. So conservation has moved on and we're, you know, we're very much thinking about what nature can provide for people in terms of their service, in terms of services and nature for health is one of those. Um, and sort of Shinra and Yoko became aware of it. It's a bit of a curiosity in the English English speaking media. Um, and to my mind, it very much spoke about, um, you know, Japan and Korea, they have this nature for health uh, and it seems to be most structured through forest therapy. In the UK, we have nature prescribing. So my overall aim was to try and understand what we could learn from that and what we could bring back. Um, and essentially, it was to try and answer this question of whether or not they had a sustainable model for, for nature of nature for health that we might be able to um, might be able to steal or borrow from or just take influence from or find insights from. Um, and I very much looked at practice, research and policy and business as well across across that system. Um, so yeah, met with lots and lots of people. So the approach was through meeting different stakeholders, semi-structured meetings, and and generally just trialing practice with with a wide range of people. So thirty six meetings in total with, you know, with forest sites guides, academics, site managers, government agencies, business leaders, and forest therapy, sort of forest therapy businesses as well, politicians too. Um, so first of all, what is it? A lot of people. Um, might not be aware of, of what forest bathing is. Um, so it's very it's, it's very loosely defined and it's often dependent on local local knowledge and experience of the different practitioners. So it's not especially well defined practice, but um, the key elements seem to include the, the forest environment, structured or guided time, meditative or mindful activities, um, a deliberately slow pace um, and engaging as many senses as possible. So with this overall aim of enhancing of enhancing health and some of those ways that you might engage the senses might be things like, you know, tasting edible leaves or touching different tree types, bark, you put your hands in the stream, closing your eyes and then, you know, zoning in for, the, for that hearing side of things. Um, and smell, you might smell the forest floor, that kind of thing. Um, and then the history of it. So um, I think a lot of people perceive it as being this kind of ancient Far Eastern practice, but in reality it was it was coined relatively recently in 1982, but still they've got quite a lot more experience than we do in terms of nature and health. Um, but it was coined by the Japanese Forest Agency um, and this was, you know, it was just driven by a need to promote forest use. So in both countries, Japan and Korea, um, cheap imports have sort of pulled the rug under from underneath the forestry industry. So um, they have all these forests in which they, they kind of need to um, you know, um, try and promote the use of really. So throughout the 80s and 90s, it grew organically um, in popularity, um, based more on a feeling um, 
less less more less about the evidence more about just that people knew that going into the forest was a was a good thing to do um and it was very much framed around work stress and sort of low vibrancy of the forest region so those were the, the two sort of drivers and then in 20 sorry 2005 mid 2000 they got this cash injection for the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Agriculture. And then from 2005 onwards, they used that money then to create this evidence-based um, forest therapy. So um, it moved from forest bay to forest therapy. Um, and they were trademarking um, these things called forest roads and, and the forest base, the one, I think a forest road is bigger than, a forest base is bigger than a forest road. Um, and they used that money then to go around to 38 different sites, testing, um, using physiological testing around different sites to, to set up the accreditation system for which they, which they would then assign whether or not a, a certain site is a forest therapy um, registered site or not. And they established a, a, a society in order to do that, the Forest Therapy Society. Um, so that all sounds well and good, but the, one of the problems is that there's kind of competing philosophies um, over there as well. So. There's also a practice called called Kurort, which is from the German word meaning health spa. So it's based on Kneipp therapy, so a form of um, hydrotherapy. So again, another sort of fringe uh, naturopathic um, medicine that that, that is, is taken off a bit over there. And that's very much that's more about keeping the skin two degrees below um, its normal temperature and keeping an elevated heart rate. Um, that's the kind of principle behind that. So it's a bit more active. There's also another, you know, more confusingly. There's another group who use forest therapy, this, this, this version called Shinrin Roho, which is tra also translates as forest therapy, but that's more based on the treatment of conditions. So um, it's a bit, a little bit, the picture's a little bit blurred. And what that does in terms of accreditation is obviously crew has its own accreditation and forest therapy has its own accreditation. And, and what's happening is that um, different sites are choosing different accreditations. And often because it comes with fees, you have to, you have to pay a fee to the society to get that accreditation. Um, in some cases, they some sites were choosing the cheaper option. Some sites weren't choosing anything at all. So, in terms of accreditation of this of this practice, it's a, it's a little bit blurry, and it depends on um, some in financial influence about accreditation. So, um, forest therapy then has continued very bottom up. There's a rely, reliance on on private practice. Um, there's no national um, program involved. Um, the health agencies um, aren't involved. So it's been very much left to, to grow from the bottom up. And that private practice strategy is all about making better use of forest resources, regenerating forest areas, incentivizing people to move from metro area to the forest area and to reduce national health burdens. So you can see there that there's a lot of focus on local regeneration and not so much about health. And that was one of my overall observations was that, to my mind, there were two main motivations why people were getting involved in forest therapy over there. And one was stimulating the local economy of rural areas. And the second one was if you if you're able to get some corporate involvement through uh, corporate social responsibility profiles. And what I'll do now is just, I'll quickly run through a few of those case studies to, to emphasize those points. One of those is at Akatawa National Park, which is um, one of the first forest therapy sites, a really beautiful site. Um, they've got 10 guides there in, in total, um, four forest therapy guides. Um, they get about 800 users a year from different sort of cities around the country. Um, and lots of older people using it and the cost is about 110 for four hours but what's what's interesting about this site is that it has use it has interesting ties to the hospital so once a month the doctor from the hospital will do a walk with the doctor and that they see about 800 people a year that way um and so nearby is Kiso hospital and um what's happening there is that they've, they've, they've sort of worked together for about 10 years um, and it's a good case study in sort of overall what's happening of the overall aim in Japan as to what they're trying to achieve. So Japan has a health insurance system. The law says that companies, um, well, part of, part of their system is that the law says the companies have to offer health checkups. So in, in relation to the growing workplace stress, workplace stress, there was a, a recent law that said companies have to offer a yearly health checkup for people. And this can be taken anywhere. Um, and what the Kiso have done is that they've, um, They've looked off of this forest therapy doc, so they try and attract people from the cities out, out to the hospital, it's where they can take that yearly health check, and then they do some forest therapy on the side. So this is the idea that you're thinking about your health, do some forest therapy on the on the side. 
But what's important is that you, yes, your, your health checkup is covered, but the forest therapy isn't. And so this sort of gets to the root of one of the aims of the, the stakeholders out there. And that they're really keen to try and have forest therapy covered by this medical insurance, because then that would sustain the, the um, practice a lot more and would solve a lot of their problems. And you, you hear it mentioned a lot, they're really go, sort of going for this, this health insurance idea, but at the moment it seems limited as to how that's going to happen. But the, the take home from the hospital was, I was asking, you know, why, why are you guys involved in, in forest therapy? And still from the hospital where you think they'd be talking about how they too was, you know, they were pulling together because they wanted to regenerate and contribute to the regeneration of the region. Um, another quick example, a place called Chizu Totori. I got to meet the mayor of Totori. That's him there looking uh, pretty resplendent in his, in his forest. Um, and so there similarly, they, you know, they used to be a really prosperous area. They had 93% land covered by forests and needs to be, a, you know, a, 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 a strong wood producer. But now cheap imports have sort of undercut all of that. So they've taken to forest therapy, forest schools as a way to try and bring people into the into the region. Um, at the moment, it's it's they're getting a thousand users per year, but it's plateaued. You know, they had a steady increase, but you know, it's plateaued, and they're trying to work out how they increase that. Um, and next, again, they're waiting for this kind of big idea that um, that, that can help them get over, you know, increase the visitation. But they suffer from problems where you know natural disasters are a problem. They typhoons and, and landslides and flooding are, are a regular occurrence, which limit um, and damage the path and, and limit the sort of confidence in the in the in the practice. Um, and then moving on to the corporate side of things, um, Shinano Machi in Nagano is is an example of how um, a local council. Um, has got involved so they started up uh, doing forest therapy um, and they then passed it over to a forest therapy business who, who took over the running of it um, but this is very much about delivering forest therapy to bring people into into the area um, so yeah it used to be run by the local council but now a business runs it and they the, the council give the business subsidies so about twenty nine thousand a year and the business itself brings in you know nearly half a million pounds a year to the local economy so the usage is steadily increasing, as you can see from this graph, you know, up to 20, 2019, they had over 6,000 days spent there and they're working with about six, 36, 36 companies. And this is very much based around this concept of, you know, work, um, work retreats for creativity and relaxation. They try and sort of target tech companies to come out, spend time in nature and enjoy the creativity that comes from that. And they've got these really high level suites like this Nomad Work Centre, for example, as a, as a means to bring people out, but also in terms of workplace relaxation and just keeping their work staff healthy and happy. And then moving further on to the sort of corporate sponsorship side of things, so Kurot, as I mentioned earlier, this, this uh, discipline seems to be, has a lot of uh, corporate sponsorship. And the way that works is that once new routes are identified as a way you might set up a Kurot um, place, uh, or, or route. Um, corporate sponsors often come in, often come in, for example, Teo Insurance in one place called Kamin, Kamin no Yama City. Um, you know, they funded these these Q routes, um, routes for, for people to use. Um, and I think there's 61 accredited Q route sites around around Japan. So, and this again is very much around promoting staff and policyholder um, health. But importantly, they get similarly. They don't. They don't fund. Um, they don't cover um, cure or forest therapy as part of their policy. It's very much about just promoting health so that they they uh, keep people healthy. Um, and one of the places which again is, is sponsored by big business, so Toyota sponsor an environmental education in a place called Shirakawa Go. Um, again, they they choose Kuro, but this is very much wrapped up in a bigger package of environmental education, Kuro, and health walking in the forest was, was a small part of of what the activities they do. But it's really high level corporate sponsored uh, way of nature engagement. So to summarise, Japan is very very bottom up, lots of lots of variation um, and localism in models and practice. Um, so there was this research and government interest which peaked in the, in the mid 2000s, but now there's this kind of lack of frust uh, frustration at the lack of government involvement. Um, and it's, as I mentioned, it's kind of plateauing um, and they're being left behind by others, as I mentioned in, in, in a moment, Korea is doing far more interesting things. Um, and often, um, you know, forest therapy practices are supplementary to other just general recreation and health practices. But what it has got going for it is this strong local community and corporate based promotion, either as a business model or for, you know, galvanizing um, forested regions. 
So the challenges of, um, as I mentioned, insufficient visitation, which is impacted by natural disasters and, and remoteness. Um, actually, this graph is from Akasawa, the like first case study that I showed you, and it gives you a good idea as to what's happening in terms of visitation. So um, around here, let me just get the pointer. Um, There we go. So this is about the 86, 1986, when um, forest bathing was introduced. So that's about 20, 40,000 people per year. Um, then they had a forest train introduced, which then you know took visitation up even more, up to about 140,000. This this is the introduction of forest therapy. So forest therapy, the evidence-based version, led to another 20,000. But unfortunately, what happened is they had a volcano in the in the area, and it it was one of the worst ones the country had seen and it really sort of hit confidence in going out to these regions and then there was another problem where um uh the bus drivers were driving for too long and there was a there was an accident and they put in legislation which meant um you had to take more breaks and this led to you can't you couldn't do a, a day trip from the cities to akasawa, to akasawa so that again put an impact so that's an indication of some of the challenges they're trying to face in in getting this um you know visitation up um, and then, so in terms of future prospects, um, you know, they're still hoping for this big idea to galvanise the, sec the sector. Um, so health insurance is, is one option, but it doesn't seem to be any any sort of prospect of that anytime soon. But it's all framed around, you know, to meet today's health challenges. So they've got an ageing population, they've got a negative birth rate. So that means they've got, um, you know, too few people bringing the income tax in, which, they, which to pay for the health costs and, and they've got, so it's basically healthcare is getting more and more expensive, so they need to come up with initiatives to try and keep people healthy and living longer. Um, so on to Korea, so this is as a different situation in Korea, it's very top down, very government led, led with lots of investment. So similarly, like Japan, they've got two thirds forests. But deforestation post-war meant that um, they had some very stark lessons in ecosystem services of what forests do for, um, and they had you know, disastrous flooding and landslides post-war. So from the 1970s onwards, onwards, they went from, they went into a massive program of reforestation so to put their forests back. And then as a result of that, you know, they, these ideas about multiple benefits of forest and the recreational value started to increase. And along with that, visitors, uh, recreation visitors um, started increasing. But the, one of the real stories is beyond 2010, so 2010 to 2013, they saw a, an increase in 117% into these healing forests, um, which was, you know, eye-opening eye for the government because it raised awareness of all these people wanting to, um, uh, you know, use the forest for healing and keep, keeping healthy. So what the government did was respond by the, with this idea about forest welfare and, and heavy investment in that. So forest welfare in South Korea is the economic, social and emotional support uh, to people's well-being from forests. So um, it's based around the a life cycle. Um, well, forest, where it, forest welfare is based around the life cycle. And they try and implement um, centres and activities that, that mirror that. So for children, there's forest kindergarten, adolescents, you get education centres. For all, there's these recreation and leisure sports centres for the elderly. There's forest healing centres and the end of life, they've even got tree burial forests. So um, what I couldn't work out was that a lot of these concepts seem to overlap to me. I couldn't quite work out what the, the, the differences are in terms of, um, you know, the way they're demarcated. I can, you know, forest recreation versus forest sports, for example, but this is the way they, they, they present it. So, um, yeah, the sort of three key things that they did was um, one was about the, uh, having the legislation in place. Um, so they have the Forest Welfare Promotion Act, which is 2015, and this is the world's first case of legislation specifying rights to forest welfare. So that whole act is about con contributing to improve people's health and wellbeing through the quality, through, sorry, and quality of life through uh, systemic forest-based uh, welfare services. And part of that legislation mandates for a Forest Welfare Institute, and that was established in 2016, and they are there involved in providing welfare services, um, the environmental imp improvements through a, a green fund, uh, which is about uh, 44 million a year, I think. Um, they, they're responsible for developing the forest welfare specialist careers, so you can be a forest therapist or a healing instructor. And unlike Japan, where it's a bit sporadic, it's not really sustained, um, it's quite an attractive job um, out there. We can earn $2,200 US dollars a month by doing that. And, 
some of the people I spoke to, it was, it was a lot of career changes moving from, for example, Samsung, you know, highly paid jobs at Samsung to come and do this job. Um, so the, the Institute itself also accredits uh, welfare businesses and administers a voucher system. So this, they have a system for people that are alienated from forest welfare and you get $90 a year to spend on it um, if, you, if you don't have the means to, to use it. Um, and then research evaluation they're working on uh, and also working across government departments as well. So a big focus of their program is these, these big infrastructure projects. So obviously there's a lot of forest that existed before then and in 2018 they, you know, they, they, they say they've got 170 recreational forests but then additional forests have been added which meet the needs of, of forest welfare. So for example 67 healing forests they've got. Um, but some of the kind of more eye-catching um, examples that they have there are these big showcase centres. So there are four national centres for forest therapy, three national centres for forest activities and one memorial park. And I visited one of those big national centres and um, they're a real kind of eye-opener in the amount of money that's been spent on forest therapy in, in Korea. So this one centre cost 150 million US dollars to build. Um, and it's taken in total investment of 1.25 billion US dollars over 2010 and 2015. It requires 10 million a year to run. Um, but notably that 30% of the cost is only recovered through, through their business activities and the rest is supported through government. So it just gives you an idea of um, some of the high level um, infrastructure they've got there. So I'm going to try and play this video, which is uh, gives you an idea of this, this walkway that they've got. So that walkway alone cost $2.3 million. It was from um, imported Canadian Canadian wood. So, you know, they've absolutely gone to spare no expense, expense to do that. Um, but really incredible facilities, you can imagine for, you know, for disabled access, it's really fantastic. Um, they've got these hydro massage machines. They had eight of these ones. Um, and each one of those costs $700,000. Changes in, in measure and, uh, and monitoring people's health as they as they come to the centre. So with all of that, you'd think it was really expensive, but it's super affordable. Um, one day program and one meal cost fifteen pounds. Two nights and three days is one hundred twenty-two. One week to four weeks stay is three hundred twenty-three. Um, and in terms of visitation, they're aiming for one hundred thousand a year, but they're not they're not at that stage yet. Um, but um, so in 2018, they did. They got visitors. Well, the total visitors was about 15 million, um, bringing in 50 million in total. That's across all recreational centres. But in general, there was an overall acceptance from the stakeholders and the people I spoke to that yes, the, the revenue was never going to match the investment. So it's kind of recognition that they're they're providing the service for the people. So with all that level of investment, um, and you know, experiencing what goes on in Korea, you just sort of left wondering why is there so much for us therapy in Korea, how they got to a stage where they've been able to invest so much money into it. Um, and one of those things is about um, filial piety, which is a new new concept for me, but it's the idea that, you know, the younger generations look after the older generations, and that was always really strong in, in Korea. Um, but it's starting to change. There's these media driven notions of independence in old age and, and older people increasingly want to be independent and not being a burden um, to to their family. So they want they want options to keep fat, to keep healthy and to keep themselves fit. And forest therapy is one of those. And um, if this video works as well, this is a common sight in, in Korea. You get these kind of armies of, of a little older ladies just banging up and down these these walkways, keeping healthy and chatting away. It's really it's really good to see. Um, so that's one reason. The, another thing is that the five day week only came into it came into play in the year 2000 and also they've had an economic boom. So they've got this more leisure capital, free time, for more money and they want things to spend it on and things things to do. And so this, this is all fueled this demand for forest therapy. Um, another factor is that you know, it's two thirds forest cover and there's a, there's a dominance of private forest ownership, which is 68 percent. But the problem is with all of that, it, forests are only producing 0.1% of Korea's GDP. So there's this real incentive to get more from their forests. Um, and so forest therapy is thought of as a mechanism to galvanize rural and forested regions, as, as I've mentioned before in, in Japan, but that's also, also happens in Korea. Um, also of significance was that there was the research push and the associated media coverage. So um, 
61% of the total population is aware of the effectiveness of forest therapy in Korea. And that rises to 75% when people, when they sort of survey people with existing health problems. So they've obviously managed to get that, that, that they made the shift from just, it was a feeling that spending time in forest is good for you to, uh, you know, a science and that, that, that has been cemented in the public consciousness. The right people in the right place is always an, uh, a, a factor with these kind of things. And I met with this guy who is Professor Won Sop Shin. Um, he was a long time proponent of forest therapy, um, but he found it, he got the job as the forest career forestry minister um, in, from 2010 onwards, I think. And he was instrumental in, in, make, in, in getting all of this legislation and this investment through. And so overall, when you ask this question as to why there is so much, it, the answer that comes back is this public demand. So all of these things are fed into this, this idea that the public wants it, um, which has led to the political action. So overall, um, conclusions from the, ferris, from the fellowship were, um, you know, these huge differences between forest therapy systems in Japan and Korea. Japan very bottom up, Korea very, very top down, but Japan is losing ground. Um, you know, Japan is very research led, whereas Korea is, is very practice led as well. So um you know this overall question is do they have a sustainable model of nature for health probably not Korea is has unsustainable levels of government funding and they're working to try and galvanize the private sector because they realize it's probably unsustainable levels of funding at the moment um whereas Japan is the opposite it needs institutional impetus it needs the government to get behind it or perhaps health health insurance to, to support it and they both need you know medical community involvement which isn't isn't happening at the moment really um, as I mentioned, the accreditation of the site within Japan is it's it's problematic at the moment. It depends on costs, but there are lots of similarities between our challenges and there. So in both countries, you know, we need a bit more healthcare buy-in for the for the work that we're trying to do. Access issues are a problem. We need more urban initiatives and aligning practice to specific public health issues and making it relevant to public health issues is, is important. Um, differences exist in that, of course, we don't have the natural disasters to um, contend with as much. Um, and their difference as well is that they're approaching it from a, a position of abundance and they've, they've got their two thirds of forest back because of the, the problems that it saw. Whereas for us at WWC, you know, we're working on Nature for Health because we're trying to, you know, restore wetlands and, and, and try and regain that service that's been lost to us through, you know, potential wetlands for health. So um, a lot of these uh, fellowships come with recommendations. So um, I'm kind of loath to, um, you know, try and offer advice for what I learned, but if I were to, these these would be some of my recommendations. So um, as I mentioned, very top down, bottom up difference. And there must be a sweet spot in the middle there between private practice, but also the incentivization via, via the government or via um, other means. And perhaps that's through something like innovative, innovative finance structures, you know, maybe required to financially better support the sector. So perhaps something like social impact bonds. Um, and access issues, um, again, are always going to be a problem. The need for urban nature provision, we need to be building more of this stuff in um, in where people live in the urban environments. Um, and it, the, the fellowships highlighted this, this this need for champions and political proponents of, of what you're trying to, to get uh, implemented. So find them, work with them. Um, health sector buy-in is a big, uh, big thing that we need to work on. So highlighting the important, or importance of evidence and comms with, with those. Um, but also noting that the cost benefit was less important in Korea, so we don't have to be uh, have everything paid, for, you know, well, um, you know meeting, measuring up in terms of cost benefit. Perhaps we could prioritise things like quality of life over, you know, gross, gross domestic product more. Um, and research and media providing that impetus. So I was really taken by that, the way in which just some research in the associated media um, led to this public demand, this public knowledge of, of, of the benefits, you know, can we apply that to nature prescribing as well? We've got this window of opportunity where, where you know, green prescribing is, let's call it trendy at the moment, if we don't, if we don't capitalise on, on it and get it cemented, embedded in the public consciousness, consciousness and having them wanting and asking for these services, then we might, uh, we might not um, get to that, that um, having it systemically embedded. So overall, this creating the demand was the key. So let's, you know, try and work out how they created that demand, study it, replicate, and then, like I say, try and apply it to, to nature prescribing it in this country. Um, okay, that's about it then, I think. Thank you for listening. Um, very many thanks to Winston Churchill Memorial Trust for funding and WWT for allowing me to, to do it as well. So yeah, I'll take some questions. Apologies for the mess up at the start.
that was great, great. Jono. Uh, really interesting Jono. stuff. Uh, really interesting to hear about um, um, the forest basing forest kind of situation in Japan and South Korea, which we often hold up as this kind of really evidence based, government supported, kind of well embedded part of the healthcare system, whereas maybe it's it's not quite that straightforward. Um, so lessons for us to learn. Um, I've got one question here from somebody, and if anybody else has questions, please feel free to, to type them in using the Q&A box. Um, so a question from somebody they were wanting to emphasise is not a criticism, but a query. Um, they say, I completely understand the importance of including blue as well as green, but does calling it blue prescriptions not complicate the message for the health sector? Um, yeah, it, it possibly does. And I, I, I completely recognise that the name in itself can be problematic. We don't need to be, um, you know, creating those demarcations. But, you know, it, I think it also feeds into the idea that a lot of these activities like green prescribing, blue prescribing, whatever you want to call it, there's a need to demedicalise it. And there's a need to just, um, you know, if you, if you call anything a calling a thing a prescription, then often people will look at it and think, that's I don't need a prescription, that's not for me. Whereas time in nature, you know, most people can, can use it and, and, and take benefit from it. So I think there's a need to embed a lot of this stuff just as good things that, that can be doing. So taking away the prescription element to it, um, I kind of agree. And we came up with blue prescriptions quite a long time ago to mirror green prescriptions. So it's kind of stuck. And actually, yeah, in the last, you know, few months, I'm starting to realise myself that this this branding of it perhaps isn't that isn't that useful. So I completely with I completely agree with that point, and it's something that we are we're thinking about. Great, thanks, Jono. Really interesting. Um, so I I guess I had a question, which is, and you sort of touched on this a little bit, but I wonder if you think we've got some learning to do from the way this has been done in Japan and South Korea for the current kind of move towards nature-based social prescribing here in the UK? Um, so what, what can we learn from it? Mm. Yeah. Um, so I think it, a lot of it comes down to that, um, the kind of evidence and the so, they, you know, they're, they're, they're screaming out to try and get the health sector involved in a lot of this stuff, but it, it seems like they haven't been able to do it. Um, and everybody I spoke to, you know, they kept referring back to it, it comes down to evidence and also specific evidence. So I think we, we kind of all know that generically, if you spend time in, in forests, it's good for you. But from their perspective, they need that specificity of if I spend X amount of time, uh, how it is going to impact you know, proper public health issues like dementia, like diabetes, like obesity. So, you know, they they haven't done that yet. And it's probably why they haven't had that, that, that health um, sector input. And I think that's where, again, we, we can take lessons from that and learn from that and try and, as we're developing our programmes, is try and understand how we can uh, target it to, to, to public health problems and make it relevant to, to public health. Yeah. Yeah, great, thanks. And another one around forests. Um, this question is uh, from Andy asking, uh, so what do the private sector businesses do with their forests if ownership is so high and productivity is so low? What motivates yeah. them? <laughs> it's quite interesting that. So I was trying, I was trying to work out that. And it feels, it, it, it seems like it's very, very um, piecemeal in that people often just have a hectare. I don't know how it works, but I was told that often it's really, um, uh, what's the word, truncated and, and you know, people might have a hectare of forest somewhere and often they don't know that they've got it. So the guy, um, well, what Professor Wan Sot Shin, who was, he was trying to explain it to me, is that often it's inherited and so people will live in Tokyo and they'll have a hectare of forest in Shinanumachi and that happens in like patchwork all around. So you've got to try and organise all those, all those landowners to make use of the forest, but this thing, it's an impossible challenge. You've got, you've got people who don't even know that they've got land. So it's complicated. And that's the, what they're trying to do at the moment is to try and work out how you've got all this patchwork bit of forest and ownership and turn it into uh, useful activity. Hmm. Yeah, interesting, thanks. Uh, question here from Tom. Um, what do you see as the challenges or solutions to the difference between forest and wetland sites for well-being? 
um, obviously forests are tall and can surround you more. So, so do you see any sort of differences between those different kinds of quite different habitats really and how we interact with them? Um, I must say, I'd say part of the a part of the fellowship and part of the way that I'm working at the moment is it's quite like as I presented today, it's quite strategic. And in terms of I guess it relates to that steer project in this, we haven't really got to that that really grassroots level of the things that we're we're delivering and how things like what you're doing in forest differ to how what you're doing in wetlands. And that's what we need to get to. So for example, we've been you know we've, we've done pilots and we're working on trying to get the funding to do this stuff but in the next 12 months that's where we're going to get to i think is just trying to work out what works in, in wetlands as as a habitat versus what you might do in, in forest for example so i mean off straight off the bat you could say you know they, they as i mentioned at the start they're doing things like um you know sensory stuff around the differences of, of bark and you know different tasting different leaves and things like that so some of that will translate to wetlands um but um, you know that there is a there is a question about how different habitats and different environments impact health in different ways. And Ben, you know, don't you? It's, it's it's a question that we need to get to, and how different elements of different environments impact health in different ways. And that's that's what we'll, we'll ultimately will feed into the way that we're delivering it in terms of a prescription. If we're if we're going down that route. Yeah, absolutely agree. It's uh, it's definitely something we need to get stuck into a bit more. Um, and we've talked a lot here about uh, about that kind of people as sort of receptors of the potential benefits of natural environments. But and a, qu a question here that somebody's posted um, about the relationship the other way around and someone uh, asking, has there been any pushback from nature conservationists in Japan or South Korea about encouraging more people into forests? So yes. for example, disturbance to forest wildlife. Um, how do we manage that trade off? That's a good question. Um, one of my, what, well, yeah, the, I should mention as well, my report's going to come out soon. I'm just sort of wrapping, <laughs> wrapping it all up so people can read a lot, a lot more about this. But that was one of the, my, one of my questions was surely there was a lot of pushback from, from different, different organizations about A, the invest, level of investment that's gone into it. And one of the, one of the key opponents were the environment, Department of the Environment, apparently, because they were worried about this infrastructure, how it impacts existing nature, and also the the, the footfall and the um, the um, you know the amount of increased use of these sites. So yeah, that was that was something that was that was um, um, yeah thought about. And I'm trying to think of what the what the solution was. And I think it was built into that Forest Welfare Promotion Act in that you had to do environmental assessments, and it, that was one of the criteria that you had to demonstrate you were mitigating for was that you weren't going to impact the, the local environment that much. Yeah, thanks. Really interesting um, stuff for us to, to think about. Um, question, I said we've got lots and lots of questions and not enough time to get through them, but just one last question here from Colm, which kind of has two parts and is uh, quite involved, I think. But uh, first part of the question is, have you been in touch with mental health recovery colleges uh, directly to promote and develop models of access to wetlands and green spaces? Um, not yet, but at Steer, so part of that networking that we were talking about, um, there is a mental health recovery college down there, and actually, I think they, we've already got those links. So the folks at Steer have already been approached by that college, and they will be one of the first people on our list to go and say, look, we're doing this thing, let's work together. How can it work for you? Perfect, brilliant. And and the other part of the question is, have you promoted supported volunteering for people recovering or with mild to moderate learning disabilities? Have we done that? Uh, not yet. Um, but again, it's it's something that um, we can look into. Yeah. Yeah, I know that sort of that connection between sort of prescribing, but more sort of active, if you like, as sort yeah. of volunteering rather than yeah, so, just kind of visiting yeah. is an important part potentially. It is, and volunteering in many forms is is a huge part of what WWT does. So, and especially at Steer. So, yeah volunteering will be part of the, the overall um, sort of health programmes that, that we work on down there. Perfect. That's great. Thanks very much, Jono. Alrighty, well, sorry to those of you who we didn't get to your questions. Hopefully it's been a, an interesting session for you. I'm just going to wrap things up.
with a little promo for our next webinar. Um, so thanks very much indeed to Jono for a really, really interesting session. Um, I'm just going to stick a little link into the announcements box. So hopefully you can see that and I will share my screen um, just to show you what's coming up next. Um, see if this works. OK, and. So our next uh, Investing in Nature for Health webinar is on Friday, the 19th of March. Um, we'll be talking about alternative mechanisms for funding green space, so a bit of a different dimension. Um, we'll be launching our new report from our sweep project um, called Alternative Funding Mechanisms for Green Space. Uh, we've got four great speakers to discuss those kinds of questions about um, how we're going to be funding green space in the future. So Cathy Farrar from Bournemouth Parks Foundation, Nick Grayson from Birmingham City Council, Dan Hurd from Triodos Bank and Ian Mel from the University of Manchester. So a different kind of angle for our next uh, Investing in Nature for Health webinar. Hopefully we'll see you there. There's a link I've just sent out um, or you can uh, we'll be advertising the, the webinar through our usual channels on Twitter and so on. So uh, hopefully we'll see you there at that one. Um, but I will just uh, take the opportunity to wrap things up by saying thanks very much again to Jono for joining us. Really fascinating presentation, really useful insights. Uh, both in terms of what WWT are doing, really innovative stuff, but also what we can learn, particularly from Japan and South Korea. Um, lots and lots of stuff for us to do in the future. So thanks everybody, have a good rest of your Friday and take care. <laughs>